Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Mass Design 101. This is being brought to you uh, by Colorado State University, by the National Associations of Teachers of Singing, and by the Energy Institute at CSU. I'm John Volkins, Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Environmental Health, and I'm joined today by Christian Larange, an Assistant Professor of Research in Mechanical Engineering. Before we begin, just want to let you know, this is a wonderful workshop put on by the National Academy of Sciences on airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2, bringing together the world's leading experts on this topic. And uh, those slides and recordings are now available if you want to go check them out. Finally, I'll let you know, you can follow our other research at smtd.colostate.edu, specifically our CSU aerosol emission study uh, for performing arts workers. And now I'd like to begin our webinar today on Mass Performance 101. All right, let's begin. As I said, I'm John Vulcans, and I will uh, walk you through the first half of our presentation today, and Christian will take over. Just some quick goals for what we're going to do today. I want to provide some introductions to aerosols and the principles of filtration and filtration theory. Um, we'll then talk a little bit about mask performance testing, how we test masks, how we evaluate their performance, how we understand whether they're doing a good job or not. Quite a bit goes into that. And I know there's a lot of confusion on mask performance out there. And one of the goals of this webinar is to help you understand and weed through some of the, uh, the mire that's out there. Christian will then dispel some common myths about masks. Uh, he'll talk about best practices for mask design and use. And then of course, we wanna have some time at the end to answer your questions and you may submit questions at any time through the question feature uh, in, in one of the chat windows on GoToWebinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be uh, provided to all registrants through a link after today's webinar. All right, let's get started. I wanna begin by just talking about airborne particles a little bit. You probably haven't thought a lot about aerosols until recently. They come in lots of shapes and sizes though. And so on the bottom of this book, excuse me, on the bottom of this plot, we see a particle size screen going from about 0.1 to 100 microns. At 100 microns, you might think about something like flower dust. That is a 100 micron particle and something you can access and put between your fingers. Those particles don't stay in air very long. They fall down to the floor and if you wanted to do a little experiment, you could toss up a handful of flower dust in your kitchen and you could see those particles reach the ground in under a minute. Pollen is something else you're familiar with, right? That, that makes you sneeze and, uh, and, and gives you a, an itchy throat. We're talking about particles in the 10 micron size range. If you suffer from asthma like me, you might have one of these, a medical nebulizer. This device makes particles from about half a micron all the way up to five or six microns in size. And then at the bottom of this scale here, we see smoke, right? Smoke from wildfires, smoke from cigarettes, smoke from a fireplace. These are some of the smallest particles we find, around 0.1 microns in size. If you wanna think about uh, looking at these particles, they're very difficult to see unless they're present in a cloud. The dot on an eye on the newspaper is about 400 microns in size. And so these are very, very, very small particles. When they're by themselves, they're almost impossible to see. And of course, this little nasty guy, the COVID-19 virion, is about 0.1 microns in size as well. But you never really find a virus like this naked, as we say, in the real world. It always comes encapsulated in other things. But this is the size range of interest for what we're going to talk about today. The human body is really, really impressive at producing particles all along this size range. Even by breathing, simply breathing, particles come out of our respiratory tract. When we talk, even more particles come out of a broader size range, and we know for sure that sneezing and coughing can produce lots of particles of many different sizes. And this is one of the reasons why we have to wear masks right now, because if we're infected with COVID-19, we'll emit particles of all of these sizes out of our body. At CSU, we're also particularly interested in music and the vocal arts. 
we're doing active research on trying to define whether or not these particles uh, come out at, at, at the same size range for doing things like playing an instrument or singing. And the evidence out there points to yes. So human bioaerosol, or particles that come out of our body, they spend a huge size range. And not all of these particles behave the same. I'm gonna show some of those similar particles as before. This is a 0.1 micron particle that I've drawn here. It's very tiny on your screen. Next to it, I've got a one micron particle, 10 times larger. Next to that, I've got a 10 micron particle, 10 times larger than the previous, and then a 100 micron particle. All of these can be present in air. If this little tiny 0.1 micron particle were the size of a baseball, this would be the size of a baseball stadium. So we're dealing with this massive variation in size when we think about aerosols. That can make things challenging. For example, this 0.1 micron particle, it, move, it behaves very much like a gas molecule. It's just going to float around in air and get pushed around wherever the air goes. The one micron particle, very much the same also gonna get pushed around by air, stay airborne for minutes to hours. A 10 micron particle, that starts to feel the effects of gravity a little bit. It will settle, but only very gradually. Only when you get to a 100 micron particle, the size of say a flower grain, does that drop out of the room when you make it airborne. Still, it takes on the order of seconds. Any of these particles though, if they're present in the air you breathe, you can take them into your body. When we, look about the, when we look at this table, we see the indoor lifetime of a 0.1 micron particle or a one micron particle minutes to hours. A 10 micron particle can stay in airborne for three to 30 minutes. Only the 100 micron particle falls out of the sky or out of the air relatively quickly. If these particles can stay airborne for a long time, that means that they can get basically anywhere, in, anywhere indoors. Where do these particles deposit in your body? You see at the bottom of the table, the smallest particles tend to deposit deep in your lungs. A one micron particle actually deposits almost everywhere, in your mouth, in your throat, deep in your lungs, in your nose. Only the largest particles, the 10 and 100 micron particles, those when they're inhaled tend to deposit right in your mouth or nose. And they follow basically the same physics of filtration that I'll talk about in a second. So how do we get here? Well, the real problem is that the best filters that we want to be using to protect ourselves aren't available right now, these N95s. N95s, and I'll talk about what that means in a second, they're made essentially from what we call melt-blown polymer fibers. What you're looking at on the picture on the left is the process of creating that extruded polypropylene and putting an electric charge on it to create a filter mat of these fine engineered fibers. Those fibers are then put together oftentimes at a factory in China, to create a molded N95 mask. And unfortunately, the world just cannot keep up with the supply of N95 masks, which of course is why we're here today, making our own masks to protect ourselves from airborne COVID-19. I wanna show you a quick video that I've found to be uh, really useful. It's called The Genius of N95s. You can find it online. We didn't make this, but uh, we think it's wonderful. Uh, so I've provided the link below. And uh, as I play this video, uh, it may be uh, a little choppy. And so that's why I provide the link below. Prior to March 2020, there's a good chance you didn't know what an N95 mask was, or at least didn't think about them unless you were doing a home repair project with lots of dust, or live in a part of the world with crazy pollution or wildfire smoke. And upon learning about them, you might think, like I did, that an N95 mask is basically a really, really fine strainer, a mesh of fibers with gaps too small for dust and other airborne particles to get through. A strainer filters out particles larger than its openings, but not particles smaller than its openings. So you'd expect that with a mask, after a certain point, small enough particles will sneak through. But this isn't how N95 masks work. The particles they filter are generally much smaller than the gaps between the fibers in the mask. What's more, an N95 mask is actually really good at filtering both the largest and smallest small particles. It's medium-sized small particles that are hardest for it to block. This isn't at all like a strainer because N95s are much cleverer than strainers. 
The overarching goal of an N95 mask is instead to get an airborne particle to touch a fiber in the mask. Regardless of how big an airborne particle is, once it touches a fiber, it stays stuck to it and doesn't become airborne again. This isn't anything special about the fibers, but about the size of the particles. At a microscopic scale, everything is sticky, because the weakly attractive force between molecules is more than strong enough to hold very, very small things in place. So you shouldn't think of N95 masks like a fine window screen that keeps insects of a certain size out. You should think of them more like a sticky spider web that can catch an insect of any size as long as it touches a strand. And so N95 masks use a bunch of different clever physics and mechanical tricks to get particles to touch their fibers. First, many spider webs are better than one. Unlike strainers, where stacking many identical ones doesn't improve the filtering at all, more layers of sticky fibers means more chances for particles to get stuck. And how likely particles are to hit or miss a fiber depends in large part on their size. Airborne particles larger than a thousandth of a millimeter basically travel in straight lines because of their inertia. And because there are so many layers of fibers, their straight line paths are essentially guaranteed to hit a fiber and stick. Airborne particles that are really, really small are so light that collisions with air molecules literally bounce them around. So they move in a random zigzag pattern known as Brownian motion. This zigzagging also makes it super likely that a particle will bump into a fiber and get stuck. Particles of in-between sizes are the hardest to filter. That's because they don't travel in straight lines, and they also don't bounce around randomly. Instead, they're carried along with the air as it flows around fibers, meaning they're likely to get carried past fibers and sneak through even a mask with many layers. But N95 masks have a final trick up their sleeve. They can attract particles of all sizes to them using an electric field. In the presence of an electric field, even neutral particles develop an internal electrical imbalance which attracts them to the source of the field. This is why neutrally charged styrofoam sticks to a cat whose fur has been charged with static electricity. But unlike a cat's fur, an N95 mask's electric field isn't just ordinary static electricity. The fibers are like permanent magnets, but for electricity, electrons. Just like you can permanently magnetize a piece of iron by putting it in a strong enough magnetic field, you can electrotize a piece of plastic to give it a permanent electric field. By electrotizing the fibers in an N95 mask, they gain a long-lasting ability to attract particles, which means they capture about 10 times as many particles as regular fibers. And this is, after all, the point of an N95 mask, to filter out particles from the air, and they do it cleverly. By taking advantage of the molecular scale stickiness of matter, using many layers of fibers that catch straight moving large particles as well as zigzagging small particles, and having an electric field that attracts all particles, you get a mask, not a strainer, that's really good at trapping both large and small airborne particles, and does a reasonably good job at filtering out middle-sized airborne particles. Precisely what fraction of those sneaky medium-sized particles get blocked gives you the number of the mask. If at least 95% of those particles are filtered out, then the mask is rated N95. Okay, caveats. So N95 masks can be very effective, but if you're a healthcare worker wearing one of them, here are a few important things to look out for. The biggest influence on the performance of an N95 mask isn't actually the mask, it's whether you wear it properly. If a mask isn't fully sealed on your face, air and particles you're trying to filter can just bypass the filter entirely. Dust, smoke, pollen, bacteria, and viruses all have different sizes, and so are filtered by N95 masks to different extents. However, germs for airborne illnesses don't usually travel on their own. We breathe or cough them out in droplets, which have a wide range of sizes. So the size of the virus or bacteria itself isn't particularly relevant. N95 masks are intended to be disposable, but the demand from COVID-19 has led to a global shortage of N95 masks, and the reality is that healthcare workers have to reuse them and thus decontaminate them. It's important to be aware that certain kinds of decontamination, for example, using alcohol or liquids, can damage the electrostatic properties of a mask and destroy their filtering ability, even if the mask appears unaffected. N95 Decon is a volunteer team of scientists developing and sharing research-based decontamination methods so that masks can be reused during this crisis. Okay. So, that was a lot <laughs> to go through it really quickly, but I encourage you to watch that video. And, and again, I'll just go back so you can see there's a there's a link here that we'll provide. Um, I want to talk a little bit through some of the principles that were brought up in that really useful video. What you're looking at here is uh, basically the cross section of a fiber that might be in a mask. And what I want to show you with this video is what the airflow might look like around that fiber. 
And we're coloring the airflow green here. And then the little white pieces of styrofoam are also just tracers of the air just to show you that it's moving. As air flows around a fiber, it is essentially what we call laminar, which means smooth and layered. So air flowing over a fiber, and of course there are thousands to potentially millions of fibers in a mask, will look just like this. This is what we think about when we try and figure out whether or not a particle is going to be captured by a fiber in a mask. Christian will talk later on a lot about these uh, phenomenon and how to design better masks. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the theory here. As was said in the video, aerosol filtration is actually a combination of many capture mechanisms. And in this slide here, I'm showing you that same sort of cross section of a fiber. So you're looking down the barrel of a fiber. And of course, you're only looking at one fiber at a time here in these pictures. There are essentially thousands of fibers in a mask that are trying to do this. Gravity plays a role in pulling particles to hit fibers. Diffusion or Brownian motion being impinged by gas molecules can cause a particle to hit a fiber. Impaction by inertia can cause particles to hit a fiber. If you wanna think about impaction, you've experienced this in real life. If you've ever driven in a very light snow, you'll notice that the snow doesn't stick to your windshield. It just flows right over your car. But if you drive in a very light rain, of course those rain droplets hit your windshield. The difference between snow and rain hitting your windshield is the inertia of those falling particles. The same sort of physics happens inside a mask. And so particles larger than about one micron tend to get impacted on fibers via inertia. Interception is essentially just the particle is so big that it touches the uh, fiber because the streamline of air introduces it. And the last one, of course, is electrostatics. Electrostatics is probably one of the most important mechanisms in N95 masks. But of course, electrostatics doesn't last forever. And that's why many N95s are considered one use. This is a complicated plot that essentially shows that particle size range on the bottom x-axis and the collection efficiency of a mask or a filter on the y-axis. When you look at this plot, everything that's high up at the top of the plot means high collection efficiency, and everything at the bottom means low collection efficiency. And what you see is that all of these mechanisms tend to work on different size particles. Some mechanisms have very little efficacy for trapping particles. If you look at the blue line for settling, below about a micron, gravity can't help capture particles in a mask. However, electrostatics does work better below a micron. And so the nice thing is that we have all of these physical mechanisms interacting together to make a mask more effective, which means that when you look at the total efficiency of a mask, and I'll color that in green here, it tends to look like this. This is a characteristic curve for every single filter because they all obey the same physics. The difference from one filter to the next is how low the dip happens in that filter. Very poor filters will have a dip that goes all the way to zero. Very good filters will almost look like a flat line where they capture all of the particles. Another thing I wanna point out with this plot is that the COVID-19 virion is about 0.1 microns in size. And so we don't need to worry about anything smaller than that. Because if a COVID virion comes smaller than that, it's probably broken up and it has very little chance of still being active or infectious. Which means for the rest of this talk, we're gonna talk about particles larger than about 0.1 microns or about 0.5, all the way up to 10 microns. That's the area of concern where we want masks to be effective. I will also say, that above 10 microns, every single mask is very effective at pulling particles out because of gravity and impaction. They are essentially 100% efficient. So when we think about designing good masks, we want them to be good in this range from about 0.1 to 10 microns. I put this slide up just to give you some educational resources on filters. There's a lot out there. I like, uh, a couple publications uh, made by the EPA or Environmental Protection Agency. They're on the left here and they're free. EPA has a technical webinar on filtration theory. It's long and I admit it's a little boring, but if you wanna dive in, I provide the link at the bottom. On the right side of this plot, there is a standard 
that talks about the method of testing for ventilation and air cleaning devices. These are basically home furnace filters that you use, but it has a lot of good discussion on how filters work and where to obtain them, especially for you mass designers, you might want to think about that. Unfortunately, this standard has a paywall and so you have to pay to get it. If you want the short version, in the middle, you've got the National Association uh, for Air Filtration. They have a link here uh, that I provide in the middle that essentially gives you the cliffs notes of that standard on the right. Now I want to talk a little bit about our program at CSU. We've been testing respirators in our lab for almost six months now. Uh, we did this, of course, because of that shortage of N95 respirators and healthcare workers across the state of Colorado. On March 25th, Governor uh, Jared Polis asked our lab to begin testing respirators and masks that the state of Colorado was sourcing for their healthcare workers, mostly from Asia and all of unknown quality. And so essentially, we geared up real quick to reproduce federal test methods to figure out if these masks are performing according to advertising. As I said before, N95 means 95% removal efficiency for particles that flow into the mask. That means inhalation. The mask also, however, must pass a breathability metric, which is really important. For those of you who have worn a mask that is hard to breathe through, two things typically happen. You take the mask off or you create a leak path to make it easier to breathe. If you create a leak path for the mask, of course, you're not using the mask to its full ability because air is going around the edges of the mask. And so having a breathability metric is really important as well. And of course, if the mask is too hard to breathe through, it might cause you some distress if you're working under a high active uh, respiratory workload, which I'll talk about in a second. There's only one federal lab in the country at the Centers for Disease Control that actually can stamp a mask with the N95 label. And it's very difficult to achieve that, which is one of the reasons why there are so, so very few N95 manufacturers out there. I also want to mention that if you're very interested in N95 testing, at the bottom of this slide is a link to all of the NIOSH methods for how they certify N95. We follow these methods in our lab, uh, but they are quite tedious. And looks can be very deceiving. At the bottom of this plot, of this slide, are four different masks that came into the lab. And you've, of course, probably all worn some of these types of masks before. These are provided from four different manufacturers, even though they look the same. The two white ones are called KN95s. KN is really just the Chinese version of N95. They have their own standard. And the blue one are surgical masks that claim to be able to meet N95 standards for filtration. Only two of these masks passed our N95 test. And the N95 test is a, is a thumbs up or thumbs down test. You either pass it or you fail it. And the point I want to make here is that by looking at a mask, you can't necessarily tell whether it's good or bad. These all look the same. Well, how do we do this testing? I'm going to provide a quick overview of how that works. So the first thing you have to do to test a mask is ensure that it perfectly seals to your test apparatus. Our tests don't account for the leakage around the side of the mask. We're only trying to figure out is if air flows through the mask, does it stop particles? And of course, the fit is very important, but that's not what we test for here. This is a picture of Christian actually sealing a mask to one of our test rigs. What he's using there is beeswax. He's pipetting hot beeswax around the edge of the mask. That beeswax permeates into the mask and performs a really nice, hard, essentially perfect seal so that the mask is essentially welded down to our test plate. And we'll then pull air through that mask. This might look kind of crazy, but this is the exact same way that that federal lab does their testing as well, because it's proven to be so effective. So if it works, why discount it? Once that mask is sealed down, we then pull air through it. And we have to have a precise level of airflow through that mask. For the NIOSH method, that's 85 liters per minute, which is quite a lot of airflow. And this is just a picture of that sealed mask being tested in one of our aerosol chambers. The next thing we'll do is add particles to the atmosphere, and those particles will be drawn into the mask by virtue of our forced airflow. Then it's just a simple matter of counting how many particles are upstream of the mask in the air and downstream of the mask. The difference is the efficiency of that mask. 
The last thing we'll do is measure the pressure on each side of the mask, or the, what we call the pressure differential. This pressure differential, or delta P as it's shown here, is really a measure of the mask's breathability. If you want to think about pressure differential, think about breathing through your mouth when you maybe tighten your lips, and then think about breathing through your mouth through a coffee straw. You can probably get a breath of air through a coffee straw, but it takes a lot more energy and work to get that air to come through a coffee straw. And of course, if I asked you to go jogging outside and made you breathe through a coffee straw, you'd quit immediately because the pressure drop, the pressure differential for you to pull air through that coffee straw, coffee straw is just too great. And so breathability is how we figure out whether or not this mask is, is easy enough to breathe through. If it has too much of a pressure drop, it isn't breathable and it's not gonna be used effectively. This monstrosity is what our test rig looks like. It's got about a quarter of a million dollars worth of instrumentation around it. And this is how we create atmospheres of particles and test masks. All of the work is automated at this point and it all gets sent remotely to a data analyst so that we can practice social distancing when we're testing these masks. Only one person runs the actual test. This is a very busy slide, but essentially I'm gonna highlight a couple things. What this slide shows is the differences between three common test methods, the NIOSH N95 method, there is an ASTM FDA method, and then there's our custom method that we designed for COVID-19. Now, in our lab, we run all three of these methods depending on what our uh, stakeholders want. But we most often these days run that CSU custom test because we think that this test is most relevant for COVID-19. And let me show you why. I'm going to highlight just a few things on this table. The first one is the, is the sizes that we test. The NIOSH N95 test is actually geared to test really small particles because they're the most penetrating through the mask, around 0.1 microns. That size range, while it's relevant for industrial activities like a coal mine or a, a wildfire, are not essentially as relevant for COVID. ASTM, the FDA test we do, also specifies 0.1 micron, but uses other sizes as well. But typically that small particle size range is not as relevant. Our CSU custom test on the right test one micron particles, and we go from about 0.5 to 10 microns. That's the size range I mentioned before where we think COVID might be active and potentially dangerous, where you need filtration capability. The next uh, row down is the flow rate. NIOSH tests at 85 liters per minute. We test at 15 liters per minute, a much lower flow rate, and I'll explain why in a second. A critical flaw, in my opinion, of the ASTM test is that they do not specify a flow rate through the mask which means that if you test your mask according to ASTM standards, you can actually game the system a little bit because flow rate is a pretty good determinant of mask performance. You can change a mask's performance based on flow rate. The last thing is flow direction, right? So the NIOSH and ASTM methods only test against inhalation, which makes sense. We're trying to protect the wearer. But with COVID-19 and masking, we're trying to do two things, protect the community and the wearer, and so we test inhalation and exhalation. So why does flow rate matter? Well, the first thing is that human ventilation, how much air you breathe in a given breath, varies a lot by your activity. This plot here is showing essentially the range of what the flow rate of air would be into your body during a breath, depending on what you're doing. If you're sitting or standing, you're breathing at a pretty slow flow rate around 10 or 15 liters per minute. If you're biking or doing exercise, you're breathing at a much higher flow rate per breath, 60, 70, 80 liters per minute. If you're an Olympic athlete, you might even get up to you know, 120, 130 liters per minute in your breath. So the NIOSH protocol works at 85 liters per minute. That basically means a high active respiratory workload. You are breathing hard. Why did NIOSH choose 85 liters per minute? Because they wanted to be conservative. They know that at higher flow rates, masks don't perform as well, especially for some of those smaller particles. And so they wanted to be as conservative as possible because NIOSH is charged with protecting all workers in all conditions. We at CSU think that's great, but of course for COVID-19, a lot of us are not wearing a mask for 12 hours breathing at 85 liters per minute. 
we're sitting at a desk, we're standing in line somewhere, or we're out in public. And we're probably breathing at a rate around 15 liters per minute. So that's why we chose that flow rate. Yes, the federal government realizes that mass testing is confusing and there are lots of different tests. And so it's hard to understand who to follow. The National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine are working to help out the federal government and actually have been working on this issue for a couple of years. I put on the left here a link to a National Academy report that essentially says, yep, FDA and NIOSH don't always agree and it's confusing for everyone. We need to work on this. And so this committee that put this publication out, the link is at the bottom, is actually continuing its work. And my hope is that in, in months from today, we'll, we'll hear more from them about how to harmonize all of these test protocols, especially for things like COVID. Let's talk a little bit about how masks perform now. What you're looking at are 24 different homemade masks, but very similar to the types of masks you'll see in the general public, made from batted cotton, they have inserts of filters, some are high thread count cotton, some are multiple layers, some are one layer. We tested all 24 of these masks. And here's what we got, an incredibly wide range of performance. Let me orient you to this plot. On the x-axis at the bottom, going left to right, is that same particle size scale I've been talking about all day long. It starts at about half a micron and goes up to 10 microns. On the y-axis, we've got the fraction of particles collected by the mask. An N95 would essentially be a flat line at the top of this plot. It's going to collect almost all of the particles. But what you can see here is that among 24 different mask designs, we see a wide variation in how well those masks perform. Why is this important? Well, because we know that COVID-19 is present in air at all of these particle sizes. There has been some confusion about what particle sizes are relevant for COVID-19, but that is coming clearer and clearer that we need to worry probably about all of these particle sizes and greater, up to about 100 microns. Up until recently, the World Health Organization essentially said, you know what, you only need to worry about particles that are probably larger than 10 microns because we think those are the only ones that are infective. And the good news is that just about any cloth mask will stop particles larger than 10 microns because you can see all of these masks converge to high collection efficiency or good protection at about 10 microns. And I can tell you that the physics tell us that above this size, all of the masks are going to continue to be good. However, Smaller than 10 microns is where you see a lot of the masks starting to perform less well. Not all of them, but many. So what makes a mask perform well or not well? We'll get into that in a bit. Let's talk about just maybe one mask. Mask number four. This is two-ply high thread count cotton. That's all the mask is made of two layers of high thread count cotton. This is a pretty common mask. Many of you have probably worn a mask like this. If the mask is seated perfectly to your face, this curve is showing you the performance of that mask. And like the other masks, it has really high collection efficiency at around 10 microns and really low collection efficiency around one micron. The problem, of course, is that if you're in an environment where there are one micron COVID particles present, and they're at high enough concentration to potentially give you an infectious dose after say 20, 30 minutes or an hour, this mask is not providing as much protection as perhaps you'd like. If you add a MERV 13 filter to that very same mask, so we're adding a third layer to the mask, MERV 13 is essentially an industry term which means minimum effective reporting value, and the number 13, higher means better, is essentially the same material that is made from a high efficiency home air furnace filter like you see here on the right. You can go to a big box store and you can buy this filter material. And in fact, a lot of this filter material is being sold now online by companies that you can find on the internet. As an aside, this filter material is very much similar to what N95s are made of. So if you add a MERV 13 filter layer to that mask, look what happens to its efficiency. It becomes very much like an N95 mask, which is great. However, many of these filters are electret filters. They have an electric charge on them, like the video said. If you wash that mask three times, 
you take off that electric charge. And while the efficiency isn't totally taken away, you lose a lot of it. However, it's still a pretty good mask at that point. Now I'll pause here to say that we have all of our results like this at our webpage, jv.colostate.edu backslash mask testing. And you can go see and interact with all of the different masks to find out what sort of mask you're wearing or making and how it performs relative to others. We also show things like if you wash the mask, what happens to it. We're working on putting this all together in a more easy to digest fashion. We're creating a metric called the mask protection factor. The protection offered by a mask is really what we all care about, right? When I show these efficiency plots like the one here, there's a lot going on here. The bottom line is, well, how much safer am I going to be if I wear this mask? We're working on developing a metric that essentially communicates that. The reason it's not straightforward, of course, is that the mask uh, protection factor will depend on the size of particles present in air. It's gonna depend on how well that mask fits your face and how breathable it is. It's gonna depend on how quickly you're breathing, your ventilation rate. And of course, all of these things can change from one location to the next. They can change from one person to the next. They can change from one mask to the next. What this really means is that mask protection factors come in a range for any given mask. But if we can estimate these protection factors, it essentially communicates the reduction in particle intake or emissions that you can expect when wearing it. The protection factor is essentially our best guess at relative risk reduction. Let me show you some protection factors for some of those very masks that we looked at before. This is a graph of protection factor as a function of mask type. And the colors for these bars represent whether you're exhaling particles or inhaling particles. If you're exhaling particles, the worry, of course, is you might be uh, infected with COVID-19 asymptomatic, which means you don't feel symptoms, so you're out in the general public and you're spreading the disease. It turns out that exhalation protection factors are almost always better because when you breathe out humid air, the particles are larger because they have some water on them, and so they get collected more efficiently by the mask, which is great, which means that wearing a mask and you're asymptomatic means that the mask is going to add a, a pretty good level of protection factor. Now you're looking at, what is this, eight, seven different masks here. The masks on the right, E, F, and G, are what we'd call the good masks. They're offering a protection factor of somewhere between 10 and 20 uh, for, for most of them. That means that they will reduce your intake of particles by a factor of 10. You will be 10 times safer with that mask on than without it on. Upon exhalation, it's about the same for these, but maybe a little bit higher. The poorly performing masks are on the left they're offering protection factors between about one and three. Now, you might think, oh, a protection factor of two isn't great. Well, think a little bit more clearly on that. While good masks will reduce your risk by 20 times and a poor mask might reduce your risk by only a factor of two, think about whether you're in a room with other people wearing masks. Because if their mask is on and they're infected and that mask is reducing their emissions by a factor of two, and your mask is on, and your mask is reducing your, your intake by a factor of two, then you're actually getting a factor of four protection. This is why masks are so needed and so useful. They work both ways. I'll just conclude by saying these results are a work in progress. We're going to try and publish these protection factors on our website as soon as we can uh, test enough and make sure that our results, we have some confidence in them. But I do think this will be more useful for the community in general, because essentially we all want it bottom line. How much is my risk going to go down when I've got this thing on? With that, I will stop and turn it over to Christian, who's going to talk a little bit about mask design and best practices. Thanks, John. Let me get my slides up here real quick. Hopefully everyone can see my, my slide deck right yep. now. Um, Looks good. Great. So in the second half of the webinar, we're going to talk a little bit more about the kind of practical sides of mask design, choices that we can be making to maximize the performance um, and usability of our masks. 
So the first question really is, what does it mean for a mask to be good? There's a lot of considerations that go into um, what makes a mask good or appropriate for, for use. But at the end of the day, the three biggest things that we really care about is filtration, fit, and breathability. And although these th three things are related, they're, each one is uh, distinctly important in its own right. So the idea of filtration is how well does a mask physically remove particles or droplets from the air? Um, this is what a lot of the standard tests out there are actually evaluating, the, you know, the NIOSH and the ASTM tests. They're really geared towards the filtration side of mask performance. The second element is fit. And fit, as John was alluding to in the first half of this presentation, is how well does mask seal to your face? Um, a piece of fabric just floating around in air doesn't provide you any protection, even if it's perfectly efficient at removing particles. It's the combination of filtration and fit that will really provide you, both the wearer as well as those around you, the community protection. And the third criteria we really care about is breathability. This is how easy is it to breathe through a mask. And there's a lot of kind of elements that go into breathability. But one of the most important elements about breathability is can somebody stand to wear it all day? Because if somebody's not wearing a mask correctly, it's not doing either them or the community any good. So we'll go into these three uh, elements of mask performance and try and dive into some good practices and some things to be looking for, either when you're wearing a mask, designing a mask, um, or looking to buy a mask. Uh, so this is a, a similar plot to what John showed before, but it's really important to reiterate the fact that mask performance is strongly tied to particle size. And although there's lots of kind of detailed elements about why a mask works the way it does, um, and this is, we could spend entire webinars talking about just this plot, the most important thing to, for us to recognize when it comes to mask collection efficiencies is that we have this dip in the curve. We do really well at low or small particles. Masks do really well at large particles, and we have this low efficiency region in the, the middle. Now, by bad luck, that's kind of where the virus sits. But one of the saving graces that we have is that when we exhale, we're not ex um, breathing out viruses directly. We're breathing out viruses encapsulated in a liquid droplet. And those droplets are orders of magnitude larger than the virus. So although it can be very difficult to directly filter out the virus, we can take advantage of the fact that masks do well at these high performances or high um, do well at these larger particle sizes and they have high performance at these large particle sizes to prevent the virus from ever getting out into the community in general. Potentially the best way for us to have large scale community protection is to never allow the virus to spread beyond somebody who is currently sick. So we're going to spend the rest of today talking about this region. There's really interesting things that go on at very small sizes, but it's more the aerosol nerd conversation. So let's focus on this larger range today. So one of the myths that we hear all the time, and we have received a, a crazy number of emails and calls since we started this mask testing program at CSU. One of the things we hear a lot is the only mask worth wearing is an N95. And there's been so much um, discussion and hype and news about this idea of well, N95, the people have gotten obsessed with that term. And while N95s are you know, an important component to a safety program, they're not the only acceptable mask. Cloth masks and kind of more simplified masks can do really well and be very effective at filtering out these virus-containing droplets. Um, if we can prevent the droplets from leaving the body or getting away from somebody, uh, we've done half the battle right there. When it comes to cloth masks, one of the most important things for us to be considering is the physical construction of the fabrics we're using. Um, all too often, the masks, you know, cloth masks are being sold. There's no information about the, the material actually being used. But slight differences in fabric construction techniques and the materials used to actually make up that cloth will have a large impact on how a mask performs. 
at the end of the day, what you really want is you want a mask made from very small fibers, and then those fibers woven into small threads, and you want a lot of threads. So essentially, you want a lot of surface area in your, your fabric. The more surface area you have, the more opportunity your cloth has for uh, good filtration. The other thing that we're gonna be seeking to do is to reduce the pore size. And so what I mean by that is the gaps between different fibers and threads within the cloth. We wanna make those as small as possible and cover as much of the area, open area as possible in order to get the best protection factor possible. So you'll see on the, well, the two images we have here are microscope images of two different cloth masks. The one on the left is very nice, structured, organized uh, fabric, and maybe in some ways more appealing to look at, where the one on the right looks very messy. But there's a lot of advantages to that fabric on the right from a filtration standpoint. And one of the reasons for that is this concept that I like to refer to as the fuzzy factor. Again, that top one's nice and clean, the bottom one's much more fuzzy, and if we look at the pore sizes, so the gaps in material, gaps or holes in the material between the two fabrics, you'll see this highly structured, clean fabric on the top has these big open squares. Now, these squares are small in reality, but from an aerosol standpoint, they're quite large. On the bottom, on the other hand, this very fuzzy fabric, we have all these kind of loose strands sticking out from the thread creating this almost spider web effect. All of those loose fibers that are helping to fill up the void area in our woven cloth can provide a lot of filtration potential and actually improve the efficiency of our mask. Now, I personally really like the fuzzy factor uh, term. This is technically referred to as yarn hairiness or yarn neps. Um, and this is one of the criteria that I think you can actually physically see or feel um, in a fabric. You know, if you look closely, you can see a well-structured tight weave versus something that's a little more uh, fuzzy or open. And from what we've seen so far, that fuzziness can have a huge impact on mask performance. The other thing that we need to be looking at when considering different fabrics is how are the individual yarns put together? As a general rule, you expect collection efficiency to increase as we both increase the surface area as well as decrease the void space between individual fibers. And so what I'm gonna present here is four different fabrics that we have tested uh, and looked at under the microscope. And they're characterized in terms of TPI, so that's threads per inch. The higher the threads per inch, the more fibers are actually in there or more threads are actually in there as well as the thread diameter. And so if we looked at a single layer of this material, and this is an overly simplified um, graphic of what a, of a piece of fabric might look like, but for this quilt cotton, we saw you know, distinct threads and then large gaps between the distinct threads. It made it nice and light and airy. Uh, but there's a lot of holes. You know, you see similar thing with larger fibers, but as a general rule, the smaller the thread, the greater the surface area to thread size that we'll achieve. But what we're trying to do is recreate things such as the flannel and this Baltic cloth. Both of these cloths had much, much higher, or had higher threads per inch, and they were really tightly woven together. And so you can see for these bottom cloths, what was actually occurring is the individual fibers or threads were so tightly wound that they were directly pushing against each other. As they push together, we reduce the void space and uh, there are less opportunities for particles to slip by. So this is what we're gonna be trying to shoot for. Um, now these same weave patterns have some considerations for breathability and pressure drop, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation. But as a general rule, to improve the efficiency of your cloth mask, you're gonna be looking for a cloth that is using small individual fibers, those small fibers made into small threads, lots of threads, 
and those threads tightly woven together. It's gonna give you your best chance of a high efficiency mask. There are also kind of more um, expanded ways to improve the efficiency of a mask beyond simply the ma filter material construction. And one of the good options that is used in large commercially made masks is this concept of adding an electric charge. As John was saying, when particles are flowing past a material, if they hit a piece of the filter media, they're likely to stick. Uh, so whatever we can do to encourage particles to hit the filter material, so much the better. A static charge is a common way to do that. Now, adding a static charge to your cloth is not something that you're likely to be doing at home. You know, it's not a kind of DIY element, but you can buy batting material of this uh, filtration material. And a number of masks are starting to come out where people have bought large rolls of this material and physically sewn it into their, into their cloth masks. A concern though, or something to be aware of with these static charged masks is the performance of those masks will decrease over time. So what we have here is the same mask or the same mask style when it was new versus after it had been hand washed approximately eight times. So what you'll see is when the mask was brand new, it had extremely high performance. It actually passed the N95 performance criteria. And after eight washes, it started to lose a little bit of its performance. Now this is likely from a combination of the material physically breaking down some, as well as potentially losing some of its static charge. Now what I would also say and add to this though, is that although the performance of the mask has gone down after these eight hand washings, it's still a really good mask. This is still a mask that would provide you know, uh, some protection to the wearer, but lots of protection to the community in general. So although a mask may not be perfect, it still has potential to provide lots of protection, but it is important to recognize that the mask performance may change over time. One of the questions we get a lot from folks is, well, can I improve my mask by simply adding another layer? You know, and if I go from a two layer mask to a three layer mask, will that get me to the point of it really being safe? And although adding additional mask layers will improve its performance, this is a diminishing return kind of activity. You will only get so much performance by adding additional layers. The reason for that is, individual layers of your fabric, um, when you add a second one, the additional performance is not going to be directly additive. So for example, if we have a one layer mask and we looked at a particular particle size and saw how it did, and say it was 50% efficient at that particle size. If we added a second layer of that same material, the mask is only going to be 75%. It will not be 100, but 75% efficient. The reason for that is 50% of the particles have made it through the first layer, and then 50% of the particles get captured by the second layer. 50% of 50% is 25. If we added a third layer, it's about 88. So you have this diminishing returns um, phenomenon that goes on when you add additional layers to your mask. The reason this is so important is, although the performance of your mask is going up from a collection efficiency, the pressure drop or a breathing resistance of the mask is additive for every additional layer. So if you went from a one layer mask to a two layer mask, you have doubled the breathing resistance. If you went to a three layer mask, you've tripled the breathing resistance of that mask. And so it's a bit of a balancing act as you're designing your, your cloth masks. How can I maximize the performance from a collection efficiency standpoint while still keeping this mask practical and usable for the user. If the mask has too high of a pressure drop, nobody's going to wear it or they're not going to wear it correctly. So again, a common myth that we hear that I can increase the protection by wearing multiple masks. Well, if I stack my mask, I'm gonna double my protection. This is a, a maybe type myth. While, in, while wearing multiple masks may provide you some additional protection, it's not going to be doubling your protection. 
where where you might have an opportunity of wearing multiple masks on top of each other has to do with things such as improving the seal of a mask. So for example, if you had one mask that had good performance but didn't fit tightly to your face, adding a tighter fitting mask on top of that could help sealing. How practical this is for most users is a bit questionable, um, but might be an opportunity if you can't find a mask that naturally fits your face well. Which gets us into what it means for a mask to properly fit. Um, for a mask to work, it must fit your face correctly. One of the kind of governing pieces when it comes to face masks is air and to a slightly less uh, contaminants are going to follow the path of least resistance. So an ill-fitting mask will allow air and contaminants to leak in around the sides of the masks and provide you personally very little protection. You also have a challenge of um, things such as facial hair. Masks are really designed to seal directly against the skin. Having a beard, goatee, mustache, things like that can drastically reduce the ability for a mask to properly seal and to actually provide you protection. With all personal protective equipment, it's important to recognize that just because you're wearing it doesn't mean it's providing you protection. It's only going to work if it's being worn correctly and it's appropriate for you as an individual and appropriate for what you're trying to use it for. So a couple things to keep in mind to help prevent or minimize leaking around the mask. The first piece is the mask needs to cover your face. It has to cover your face from nose to chin, cheek to cheek. Having uh, you know, a little strip of fabric barely covering those your nose or mouth is going to provide very little protection to either you or the community. The second is you need to form a tight seal around the mask. So we encourage incorporating things such as nose clips that push the mask tight against the bridge of your nose and along your cheekbones. That's often one of the hardest places for a mask to seal. And the mask has to come in contact with your face all around the perimeter of the mask. Having a piece of material simply draped in front of your face does not provide a lot of protection. It provides fairly little protection to you as the wearer and only provides minimal protection to the community in terms of the particles that you're emitting when you exhale. And finally, when it comes to leaks, it's important to think about the stitching and seams in your mask construction and mask construction kind of processes in general. Stitching a piece of cloth inherently is adding a hole to that material. Oftentimes it's unavoidable. It's something that has to happen for the construction of the mask. But wherever possible, you want to try and keep those seams and stitching points as far away from the center of the mask as possible. And if possible, you want the sealing to actually occur inside those seams. That's what I mean by that is closer to your nose and or you want the seams to be on the outside of the sealing surface so that there's a solid piece of fabric sealing against your face. This isn't always possible, but something that should be strived for when you're designing or constructing a mask. So a myth that we see all the time, here all the time, well, the cloth covers my nose and mouth, and so it's, it's providing protection. And so it's true. Covering your nose and mouth is an important aspect of a mask working, but it's only part of the story. In order to get the highest protection factor for both you and the community, that mask has to be sealing against your face. It has to be in contact around its entire exterior perimeter. Exhaled droplets coming out of your, when you exhale, can easily escape a loose fitting mask. And a loose fitting mask will rarely provide lots of protection to you, especially for the smallest particles out there. So something we get, and this was actually a question that came up during the chat during John's presentation, is the concept of using a filter insert. So a common approach is to construct cloth masks and include a replaceable filter insert in the center of the masks. While including this filter insert can drastically improve the performance of your mask, it's important that that filter media seals well. Again, the mask or uh, air and pollution is going to follow the path of least resistance. And so if you have two pieces of cloth 
and you uh, sandwich a filter media between them, but don't seal the edges, the risk you run is that some air will go through the mat or through the filter, but lots of the air will leak around the outside edges. So it's something that really needs to be taken into consideration. Simply having that material in place does you no good if your, if your inhaled and exhaled breath is not going through that filter media. So typically what we've found is that a simple pocket with a filter media dropped in place is not being very effective from a ceiling standpoint. Next myth, a mask can only be used once. So in normal times, non-pandemic COVID times, the recommendation that groups like NIOSH would make is that masks, especially like N95s and surgical masks, were only designed to be worn once. This was being done from a contamination concern standpoint. Um, you know, in the current situation we're in, that's just not, not practical. People will need to be reusing masks the most of the time. And a mask can be reused if it is handled properly and decontaminated properly. So you need to take care to make sure that your cleaning steps aren't deforming or damaging the masks. You need to make sure that you're washing or cleaning your masks properly. So for cloth masks, you know, that's hand washing and air drying is a, is a great place to start with that. For masks that can't be washed, such as N95 masks or potentially surgical masks, there are potentially opportunities for decontaminating the mask between use. And there's a number of guidances out there that I would point you to. One of them is this group, n95decon.org. It's a collaboration of folks from around the world who are trying to gather best practices on how to successfully decontaminate your mask. Uh, the CDC, I believe, is also now uh, publishing some recommendations on how you do those decontamination steps. But it's important to recognize that every time you clean a mask, there is possibility that that mask has gotten slightly damaged or is not performing as well as it was before. So you should always be taking care uh, to do your cleaning procedures gently and if possible to replace your mask after a few cleaning cycles. How do you actually determine if a mask is fitting your face correctly? There are numerous methods out there that are used in occupational settings to determine if a mask is sealing properly or not. While these methods are, can be very effective, they're not very practical for most people at their home. So what we recommend is that you do a self-evaluation of mask fit every time you put on the mask. The first and probably simplest thing for you to try is have your mask on and simply take a deep breath in and a quick exhalation out. If a mask is sealed properly to your face, you would expect the mask to slightly suck in and you, for you to feel slight pressure on your face during an inhalation. You would also expect that mask to puff out just slightly during exhalation. It's a very simple sanity check that you can be doing and something that we recommend you do every time you're putting on a mask. A couple other things to be looking for. Can you see a gap in the mask? If there is a physical gap that you can see between your face and the mask material, it is not sealing well to your face. Can you feel air moving past your face when you breathe? Um, that's a clear indication that you have a leak somewhere. And two other really effective ones is take a quick breath, breathe in and then quickly breathe out. Do you like inherently blink or do your glasses or safety goggles or things like that fog up? If that's the case, it means that you likely have a leak around the nose seal and air is being blown up past your eyes. Again, these are very simple procedures that should be done each time you're wearing a mask to make sure it's properly sealing to your face. The next myth, my mask was rated as an N95, so we'll keep you safe. Mask ratings are based upon its ability to filter out particles. Fit tests are done on an individual basis. And so just because you're wearing an N95 mask or a mask with a high efficiency filter inside of it does not mean it's providing you protection. It is only able to provide you protection if you are wearing it correctly and you are following kind of good mask wearing and handling procedures. Um, 
the rating doesn't matter at the end of the day from a protection standpoint. It's a combination of the rating and the fit that's going to provide you protection. So mask breathability. One of the biggest um, criticisms of wearing masks is they're, they're uncomfortable. And that's, that's true. It, they are not overly fun to wear. They're not overly comfortable, unfortunately. But for a mask to work well, it needs to seal well to your face. But we need to balance filtration, fit, and breathability. If a mask has too high of a resistance, if it's too difficult to breathe through, what will actually happen is when you are breathing in or exhaling out, it will leak around the exterior surface of your mask as opposed to through the center filtration media. And again, if your mask is leaking around the edges, it's providing you very little protection. Mask valves. One of the ways people have tried to get around the discomfort of wearing masks is the inclusion of a mask valve. A mask valve is a one-way um, valve on the mask that makes it so that the mask is fully sealed when you're breathing in, but you have an easy way of exhaling out. Now these mask valves in most situations during non-pandemic situations are not a big deal. In most occupational settings, a mask valve can be very effective. But currently with a COVID type situation, we're trying to both protect the wearer as well as the community. If your mask has a mask valve associated with it, every time you're breathing out, you're emitting droplets and potentially viruses out into the larger community. So we highly, highly recommend that you do not wear a mask right now that has a mask valve. I know it's unfortunate, I know it increases some of the discomfort, but the only way that we're going to get community-wide protection is if we uh, wear the proper, side, or proper type of masks. And unfortunately, mask valves just are not appropriate for our current situation. Filter construction and breathability. So this is the same graphic I showed before when we were talking about the ability of a mask to provide filtration. And it's a balancing act between filtration and breathability. The same features that made a mask highly efficient for collecting particles can make it very difficult to breathe through. The tighter the pore, the tighter the weave, the more difficult it will typically be to breathe through. So it becomes a balancing act. Having a mask that is highly efficient, but a mask that somebody can stand to wear. A mask provides no protection to the user or the community if it's not worn, or worn correctly. And the more burdensome it is to a person to wear that mask, the less likely they are to wear it correctly. This is potentially my favorite um, mask myth. It is dangerous for me to wear my mask because it's trapping carbon dioxide against me. There are so many different ways that we can debunk this one, but you know, the first and foremost is the uh, carbon dioxide molecules that we're exhaling. An exhalation of carbon dioxide is a completely normal thing that our body's supposed to be doing. But the carbon dioxide we're breathing out and the oxygen that we're trying to breathe in is tiny compared to even the COVID virus. And these gas molecules easily pass through masks. If the air is going in and out of your mask, so is the carbon dioxide. So what about face shields? This is becoming increasingly popular in a lot of groups. Um, your masks have a number of issues from the standpoint that not only are they uncomfortable to breathe through and they uncomfortable to wear, but they kind of, they block our faces. And so we can't see people's expressions. Perhaps people have a hard time uh, hearing us because they are looking for our lips to move to hear what we're saying or to understand what we're saying. And so there's been this promotion of face shields. So these are the cl you know, clear plastic shields in front of your face. And so while there is, there is some potential for these to be reducing the transmission of droplets, the current state of the science is saying that they provide very little protection to the individual wearer, and they likely only stop a small fraction of the exhaled droplets. And so while I appreciate the fact that people feel like they may be more um, comfortable to wear, as of right now, they do not seem to be a good option in terms of protecting or from a community or personal protection standpoint. We really need to stick with those masks, at least as of right now. 
Um, the other thing I would say is, I don't know if anyone has worn a face shield all day, but I would rather wear a mask any day of the week than wear a plastic face shield for 12 hours. They're uncomfortable in their own right. So some considerations to take on at the end of the day when you're designing your mask. Filtration, is it using tight weaves, high thread count, and small fibers? Is it as tightly packed as we can practically do? Is this mask having a potential to seal tightly to either my face or somebody else's face? If it's not in contact with our face all around the perimeter of the mask, it's not doing as much good as it could. And finally, breathability. Assuming the mask seals and the mask filters out particles, is it at a breathable point so that we're not getting leakage because the pressure drop is too low or too high? And are we sure that it's comfortable enough that somebody will wear it properly? Without proper wearing of the masks, uh, the mask will not be effective. So I think that wraps up the main portion or presentation portion of this webinar. And correct me if I'm wrong, John, but I think we're going to open it up for answering some questions through the chat feature. Yeah, that's right. And um, I'm altering my webcam on so you can see me. Uh, Thanks everyone for these great questions. I've been furiously typing over here trying to answer questions uh, in the chat. And I've also taken note of a few. Uh, Christian, you want to um, take note of a few, few while I try and answer a few, and I'll probably punt a few to as well over to you. Um, I'm gonna read a couple of the questions as well that have come in because I think that they are common questions and uh, they probably deserve uh, some more attention. So. The first one is, uh, are KN95 masks acceptable for COVID? This is a good question. And uh, the same question can be applied to those blue surgical masks that we all see. Um, there have been some issues with both of those masks because early on in the pandemic, almost all of them were produced in China and there was uh, quite a good deal of fraud happening where manufacturers were saying this is an N95 mask by stamping it or putting the stamp FDA on the mask, which means nothing but sounds impressive. And the masks were failing our N95 tests. However, and Christian, you can weigh in on this as well. A lot of those masks, even though they failed an N95 test, they still had efficiency at the smallest particle sizes, the most penetrating particles of 75, 80%, which is pretty darn good. The issue with any of those masks, in my opinion, is not that they aren't pretty good filters. They have pretty good filtration capability. It's the fit. You've got to get the mask well fit to your face to have to really take advantage of that filtration ability. An N95 or an N99 that has an incredible filtration ability and really high breathability, but has big gaps around your nose is just not going to provide that level of protection you think it will. It'll provide some protection. It'll provide a protection factor of maybe two or three, but it's not going to provide the protection of, you know, a factor of say 20 or 30. I would agree. And one thing to add to that, John, from the, the tests we've done. So we've done literally hundreds of different mask variants and thousands of tests over the last six months. One of the things we did see with some of the KN95 masks, especially during the peak when they were being just produced at a fast and furious rate was low quality manufacturing, actual gaps or rips in the masks themselves. So if you're going to wear a mask, and this is not just a KN95 issue, but N95 cloth masks, things like that, I highly encourage you to you know, take a close look at it and make sure there's not physical holes in the mask. Those physical holes um, will drastically reduce the performance of the mask. Uh, next question, we want to go through these as, as fast as possible, and thank you for all these questions. We'll never be able to get to all of them, but we'll get to as many as we can. A good one is, um, this is a common theme, and I'll just read this one. Hello, I use a non-woven fabric, melt-blown cloth, disposable middle layer, uh, and then they provide the filter manufacturer. That's really less important, but they say this is a 95% filter. You know, am I doing the right thing? And Christian mentioned this before. Uh, filters on the insides of masks as a middle layer are very effective if you can get the air to flow through that filter. If I take a circle like this size and I put it on the center of a mask, but the mask you know, is over my face, the air is just going to go around that filter through other parts of the masks and it's not going to be effective. And so when you insert a filter into the mask, you literally have to build that filter into the mask. 
I'm not a big fan of removable filter inserts because it's very hard on the user to put a filter insert inside a mask that actually then seals all around so that airflow doesn't go through it. Having said that, a filter insert that has a little bit of leakage will be better than a mask with no filter insert, but it's not really taking full advantage. So, so filter inserts are, are not my favorite for the ones that are removable. A filter constructed inside to a mask and sealed around the edges is much more uh, in my favor. The other thing I'll say is that consumers or users they're not gonna change those filters out, at least not to the compliance you want them to. And so putting more work on the user to um, you know, remove and, and put filters in and out of the mask is, is not a good idea in my, in, in my opinion. Christian, do you wanna weigh in on that? Yeah, I just echo what you would say or what you said. They're very difficult often to put, often to put in place. Um, I think we've seen very few masks with replaceable filter inserts that seem to have good sealing at all. They really need to be stitched in place. The few masks that appeared to have the filter inserts seal properly were almost impossible to actually insert or remove the filters. It's just not, to date, at least me personally, I have not seen a mask that was designed to have removable inserts that seem to work well and be practical. Next question is a common one. If, if the virus will die in three days, and these are studies that have shown that the virus present on surfaces, either indoors or outdoors, tends to decay in its ability to infect people or, or the cells, how essential is it to wash masks? Can we simply let a, a mask sit for a week and then reuse? My opinion is yes, absolutely. If you have three masks and you, or four masks and you wanna rotate them in and out, you certainly can just put them somewhere and let the, the virus naturally decay before you use that mask again. I would just be, you know, the, the caveats here, of course, you have to treat that mask when you take it off like it's infected. And so your hands, you know, I, whenever I touch a, a, a doorknob out in public, I think, okay, my hands have COVID on them now. I just make that assumption so that it forces me to wash my hands and not touch my face. You need to treat your, the outside of your mask similarly when you're out in public. And so if you are gonna take your mask off and put it away for, you know, three, five, six days, you, you just need to be careful about how you do that. You need to wash your hands afterwards. Yeah, what I would add to that real quick is it the kind of the best guidance out there right now is also recommending that during that sitting period, the mask is sealed up but breathable. So doing something such as putting your worn mask into a paper bag with the top field folded over, that allows some kind of airflow as well as the mask to dry out because you don't want... Um, mold and weird things like that to form because it's trapped moisture and one of the really good suggestions i've seen is having either five or seven depending on uh, what your schedule is and so you have a mask for each day of the week and a bag labeled for that just to make it very easy i grabbed my monday morning mask i put it on at home i put it back in the monday morning bag or the more the monday bag and i don't use it again for a week just an easy way to keep track of what has been worn and what is safe to be worn. Yeah, great, great points, Christian, thanks. Here's another question. Uh, we see this a lot, and this is kind of a two-part question. If filtration efficiency is so much lower for the naked virus, is this an argument for humidification to push the particle sizes higher in very dry, cool conditions, uh, which are likely to be important in wintertime? And the answer is to that is unfortunately no. You cannot make humidity high enough indoors to where the particles will grow and stay large uh, because particles tend to evaporate whenever the humidity is less than about 90%. And so, it, you know, we'd all need to live in an aquarium store if we wanted to keep things humid, and that would create all sorts of other problems like mold formation and just discomfort in general. And so it's very hard to use humidification to keep particles large. They tend to evaporate uh, relatively quickly in, in less than a second when relative humidity is less than about 80%. And the other, the other point I want to make here is that we think about that naked virus as being point, you know, one, two microns or 120 nanometers. You will never see the virus like that in the real world because in our spit, in our saliva, in our mucus layer, there's salt, there's protein, there's fat, and all of those things don't evaporate, but they stay in the particle. And so 
when you think about a virus present just by itself in the environment, it's coated with a bunch of stuff like salt that's in your body, like protein that's in your body. And so you never see the, the virus that small. The other thing to think about is that while we emit like a one micron particle or a 10 micron particle, it's only going to evaporate down to maybe 30% of its size. So don't think so much about filtering out the size of the naked virus. You want to filter out all the particle sizes. Um, next question, can adding a nylon layer increase mask efficacy? That's a great question. The answer is yes, uh, it can in, in this regard. Nylon is not going to have really any filtration capability uh, for, for typical nylon fabrics that we see, uh, you know, the stretchable kind. But if it, the nylon adheres the mask to your face, especially across the nose bridge, it's going to pre create a better seal and a better fit for you, and that's going to add a lot of protection. The thing I see most common with cloth masks is that there's a huge gap right here on the nose or a huge gap right under the chin. And it, at that point, the mask is more like a face shield than a mask, because if you have gaps where you can get a finger in relatively easily, uh, or, or if, as Christian said, you're breathing and it's making you blink, you know, look in the mirror and breathe out hard. If you blink, that means that air is just shooting up this way. Then the mask is really much, much less effective than you want it to be. So for those of you who are building your own masks, get a good piece of you know, metal wire or some sort of metal tab that you can close down across your nose bridge. You will almost never find an N95 without that because the N95 manufacturers who have been thinking about this for years know very well where the leak points are and that's one of the common ones. Uh, let's see here. There was a question about adding electricity, adding static electricity to a mask through charging. And that can happen, right? If you walk around in your bedroom uh, and it's carpeted with socks on, you can charge up yourself, right? We've all had that happen when you touch an outlet socket and you get a shock. You can charge up masks through static electricity. And so if a mask loses its charge, can you recharge it? We don't, uh, the answer to that is yes, you can recharge it. How effective is that recharging? We haven't tested it yet. And so I, I can't speak to it, but it does sound like a promising idea. I don't know again though, how often you're going to get people who will manually recharge their masks through that sort of uh, practice. When I think about consumers, I think about myself and I'm, I'm generally lazy and I, I don't remember to do the little details. I want it to be easy for me. And so I try to avoid, you know, providing masks where the user is required to do a number of things to make it effective again. Uh, let's see, will the PowerPoint presentation be available? We will make uh, the, the entire webinar available online so you'll be able to see it and we'll post it to, to several locations. Um, Christian, are you looking at questions too? I've been doing more talking so I... Um... Yep, I've been answering some as we go here. Let me answer this one about uh, masks that deactivate the virus. In my opinion, um, these kind of antiviral coatings on masks, I'm not a huge fan of. Uh, that's not to say they might not work, but once you trap the virus on a mask, you have done 90% of the job. Yes, you might want to deactivate the virus on the mask so that you don't touch the outside of the mask and then touch your eye, but to me, the likelihood of someone doing that is really low. If you're the type of person who's wearing a mask, you're probably also washing your hands. And so, unless you like take that mask and like rub it on, a, on your tongue or something, you're just not gonna transfer the virus off. The adherence forces for particles to fibers are like a million times. So you can imagine that the, that the particles are like coated in one type of Velcro and the fiber is another type of Velcro. When that coupling happens, they don't come off. Here's a good argument I can make for them. When you go into your window in your house, your window gets dirty over time, and typically you have to wash your windows, you know, once or twice a year, depending on on uh, how, how much you know how anal you are about that. Um, but if you take your thumb to your window indoors, you can go do this and just wipe it down. You'll see all the particles with you know this layer of grime on your thumb. Those are aerosols that have deposited on your window over the course of months. You can't get those particles off your window by blowing on it. You can't get those particles off your window by taking a vacuum cleaner to it. And so particles that attach to surfaces stay on those surfaces by and large, which means that a particle that once gets trapped in a mask is not gonna come off that mask easily. So why waste your time trying to have some sort of chemical on the mask that's gonna inactivate the virus? 
especially because the virus is gonna decay after a couple days, I think that the, the emphasis on these viral inactivation is really overblown. That's my opinion. Okay. Uh, can I speak about the Nat Singer's mask? So um, we get a lot of questions about Singer's mask. The Singer's mask that we have tested so far tend to be on the lower side of efficiency because they're made of cloth or they have a filter insert that is not well seated inside the mask. The, the, the Singer's mask with filter inserts do better and these masks are offering protection factors that are probably on the order of three or four, so they're not horrible. And if you're wearing a mask and someone else is wearing a mask, you get the multiply protection factors together. So the singer's mask uh, could be improved. Uh, and, and I think, you know, hopefully those that are listening and watched the webinar today have, have picked up some, some tips for how to do that. The other thing about having something that holds the mask away from your face, so, you know, whether it's um, embedded in the mask or it's something articulating off your face that keeps the mask so you can speak, I don't have a problem with any of those techniques as long as they don't uh, decrease the fit and the seal of the mask around your face. Anything that pulls the mask away from your face essentially turns that mask you know, into a protection factor of like 1.5, any of those leak paths. So we care most about leak paths and then we care about the mask having good filtration ability. So one that I've seen several people ask about is exhalation valves and if droplets are still escaping. Um, so kind of two forms of questions I've seen. Uh, are the exhal valves um, capable of capturing particles or droplets, or is there a way to make valves that are that way? And I, I think there's a couple pieces to that, but in theory, you might be able to make a valve that was very good at stopping droplets, but you also have massive changes during your exhalation process about how fast you're breathing and the capturing efficiency of something like a plastic part for getting droplets stopped is gonna be velocity-based. So to date, I have not seen any valve designs that I would have confidence that they would stop it. I think it could be an interesting area uh, of research and where work could potentially be done. But to date, I have not seen any exhalation valves that I would feel confident are stopping a sufficient or a uh, high quantity of the droplets. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Um, uh, is singing typically disruptive to a seal since the rate of exhalation is faster? I don't think so. Um, you have to breathe out really, really hard and fast to really overwhelm the mass to push it off your face, especially if it's providing a good seal to start. If it provides a very poor seal to start, it doesn't matter because the air is just going to follow the path of least resistance and that, you know, those, those blockages don't even exist. You know, these kind of, you see the mass where you can see daylight up around the nose. Um, does spraying or rubbing alcohol on masks to help decontaminate them? Yes, but um, alcohol and solvents can degrade the performance of a mask. I would suggest you visit, uh, I believe it's n95decon.org. Those experts have been working on uh, communicating the best decontamination methods possible, and, and it's a really useful website. Um, on Christian's point about valves and masks, Valves will stop the largest droplets. These are the close talking spit droplets that you get when you're, you know, in a crowded place, you know, only 20 centimeters away from another person's face. We certainly worry about that. And that's where the six foot distancing rule comes from. But the six foot distancing rule is not enough to protect you from aerosols. And so that's why we think that you want a mask always. The mask will stop the super large droplets. The valve will stop the super large droplets, but it won't stop the aerosol. And that's what we're really focusing on with this webinar because we think that's important. Okay, Whew, we are at 11. I wanna thank everyone for attending and I hope you found this enjoyable. We will record this, we will release it. And we're looking to probably do another webinar in the future, maybe on indoor protection. And of course, we'll be doing a webinar on the results of our performing arts study as those results become available. Thank you, Christian, and thank you all for attending. I'm gonna conclude the webinar here.